Good afternoon, everyone, and you are very welcome to the National Cancer Institute's Facebook Live event today, which is titled A Dialogue on Cancer Disparities, Prevention and Research. My name is Bree Ryan, and I'm a Stadman Investigator in the Laboratory of Human Carcinogenesis at the Centre for Cancer Research here at the NCI. I'm a basic scientist by training, and in my lab, we conduct studies on lung cancer health disparities, specifically really trying to understand why the incidence of lung cancer is higher among African-Americans compared with all other racial and ethnic groups in the United States. I'm going to be the moderator today, and I'm also going to serve as a panelist. But I'm very pleased to be joined by, by Dr. Christina Dieri conright and also Dr. Verta McCaskill-Stevens. So Verta and then Christina, maybe please go ahead and introduce yourselves. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I'm Dr. Verta McCaskill-Stevens. I'm a medical oncologist, and I'm the director of the NCI Community Oncology Research Program. Hi there. I'm so happy to join you guys today. My name is Christina Dieli Conroy. I'm a clinical exercise physiologist and I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Great. So thank you very much to you both. So before we kick off, I have a little bit of housekeeping to do. So I just want to remind everybody that in addition to the topics that we're going to discuss today in the broadcast, we definitely encourage you to ask your own questions in the comment section of this video. And we also ask you that you maybe keep your comments and questions specific to today's topic. And if for any reason, if we don't get to your questions, we're going to do our best to answer them as soon as possible through the comment section below. I've also been asked to let you know that NCI reserves the right to not post any comments or indeed to remove comments that aren't consistent with our policy. So we, we thank you for your cooperation on that. And also as a reminder, we cannot answer any questions about your treatment publicly. And so if you do have any questions about personal treatment, we do ask that you please talk with your treating physician about those. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, lastly, if you have any questions at all, please do contact NCI's information service at 1-800-4-CANCER or by visiting cancer.gov forward slash contact for help via our live chat system. Okay, so maybe let's get started. So ladies, as a scientist working in the field of cancer health disparities, I think that one of the key questions that I'm often asked about is how minorities are affected differently than other populations with certain types of cancer. So as I mentioned, my, my field primarily is lung cancer. And in lung cancer, we know specifically that the incidence of lung cancer is much higher in African Americans compared with almost any other racial or ethnic group here in the United States. I think that a key point to understand as well is that even though we often talk about disparities in the context of racial or ethnic groups, disparities can also be defined by disability, gender or sexual identity, income, socioeducation, uh, socioeconomic and education, and other cancers, other characteristics as well. And if you think about gender specifically, According to some of the latest statistics in general, we find that for men, for almost every cancer type, regardless of racial or ethnic group, the incidence of lung cancer in men is much higher than, than women, for example. And so, Verta, I know that in your program, you also have come across some particular and striking disparities. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And let me share with you an example. We know that um, in cervical cancer, uh, that there are specific race and ethnic groups that have advanced rates of mortality, um, Hispanics, uh, Alaska Natives, American Indians. But it's we've learned a lot over time. For instance, uh, the rates are higher in rural areas. So this is very interesting because even though we've identified the populations, there are other factors in the rural areas. You know, it, are there issues with providers? Are there, uh, are there issues with uh, traveling for distance or standards of um, follow-up for abnormal uh, tests. So these, it makes it very important um, not, not to think about it as a single entity. I think another excellent example is in breast cancer where we have many subtypes of breast cancer. And we know that there is a subtype uh, referred to as triple negative breast cancer that occurs at a greater rate in African-Americans across mm -hmm. all age groups. However, most African-American women get estrogen receptor ER positive breast cancer. But interestingly, we're finding that there are disparities there. And that brings into play the question of access, mm -hmm. adherence to therapy, uh, whether it's in advanced disease, whether we have data for older patients, because breast cancer does occur in older patients, and they tend to be those that have a greater proportion of hormone respect, hormone positive breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's a, a multifactorial approach, I think, to disparities. Um, today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think your, your point about 
rural differences and rural urban differences in cancer disparity is a very interesting one in lung cancer and some of the studies that we have done we found that while lung cancer disparities exist across the entire United States, the degree of the disparity actually seems to be higher in rural counties. So again, it's kind of a similar trend to what you've just talked about for um, other cancer types. But what I think one of the important things and why we continue to research is that a lot of us don't understand why these disparities exist. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the reasons why um, we have a lot of work still to do, I think. Um, Christina, in, in your line of work, are there any key disparities and trends that, 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 uh, that you have seen? Yes, absolutely. I think that given that uh, USC is in a very diverse area within Los Angeles, we absolutely have a great opportunity here to actually study these disparities. A lot of what you both have spoke to, particularly within the African American community, um, and we're definitely trying to place efforts there in really figuring out some of the biologic and even epigenetic type of mechanisms that underlie those disparities. Um, or to speaking to what you mentioned about triple negative and African American women, I think that's a, a very exciting area that warrants further research because we hear so much about triple negative and African-American women. But as you mentioned, that's not the most common cancer type. Um, and so I think collaborating with individuals across the country that have the opportunities to work within these very diverse cities um, is what makes it very exciting to be in a city like Los Angeles so we can further this area even more. So as many of you watching will, will know, April is actually Minority Health Month and the Office of Minorities Health theme for this observance month is active and healthy. So Christine, I just mm -hmm. wanted to ask you this question first, given that this is primarily your field. What is known about the relationship between physical activity and cancer risk? Absolutely. Yeah. So this is a, a long, strong relationship that has been uh, well substantiated primarily with epidemiologic evidence. Um, in fact, it's typically known that life being physically active over one's lifetime can reduce the risk of certain types of cancers, primarily obesity related cancers like colorectal cancer, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, um, and perhaps others. Um, those are just the more commonly studied cancers there. Um, so that's a very important relationship relationship from the prevention standpoint. However, as we all know, adoption of exercise and being physically physically active is can be quite complicated. But specifically speaking to the type of exercise, I think that's what's most commonly asked from individuals is what can I do? What type of exercise should I do? And from those epidemiologic studies, we know that it's primarily moderate to vigorous physical activity. And really understanding individually what that means can be somewhat complicated. It sounds simple, but it can be complicated because it really just depends on how physically active somebody currently is and then deciding what they can do further. So moderate to vigorous physical activity for one person might mean walking, while for another person it might actually mean jogging. Um, I think the guidelines that we have set forth for cancer prevention are a, a good basis, um, which is three times per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity um, and the volume of 150 minutes per week. And that can be spread out throughout the week. So maybe that's three sessions of 50 minutes or maybe it's broke down even smaller. But then another important recommendation is also resistance exercise. And that's where things get a little bit more complicated to perform because that typically requires some type of access to that type of equipment. Um, but regardless, the, the risk there, the cancer risk and physical activity um, sort of paradigm has existed for quite some time. And we all know the benefits of being physically active overall as well. Yeah. So Christina, it's uh, interesting that you bring up that we have also begun to look at this in children. Uh, we mm -hmm. actually have a mm -hmm. study looking at children as well as adolescents and young adults, a very important mm -hmm. uh, underrepresented population in research. But this is actually an intervention looking at fitness in uh, those patients mm, who have acute right. lymphoblastic, lymph lymphoblastic uh, mm -hmm. leukemia. Um, and we also are looking at it in, a, in the clinical outcome, um, disease progression in the patients who have ovarian cancer and fallopian mm -hmm. tube cancer. So, you know, compromise from having treatment, but also taking uh, into consideration for the pediatric and the uh, adolescents mm -hmm. and young adults, the fact that there's an increasing rates of obesity, uh, even at younger ages as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And I think you speak to a very understudied but well needed area, which is definitely the pediatric AYA population and even some of the other less heavily studied cancers outside of exercise and cancer research. We know a lot of this work has come from breast cancer primarily, but then also colon rectal cancer as well as prostate cancer. So really expanding out into some of the populations you mentioned, I think is going to be critical moving forward. Sort of follow up on that theme a little bit, Christina. Can you talk maybe a little bit too about what we know about the effect of physical activity on cancer symptoms, shall we say, or also perhaps on the effect of, of cancer treatment? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So I think this is where we have some strong clinical studies that are ongoing and that have already happened that have really looked at what type of what effect exercise has had in an intervention setting on these patients as they go through treatment. So there's been profound effects on reducing fatigue, reducing other psychosocial measures like depression and anxiety, quality of life can improve. Um, but looking beyond psychosocial measures, there's also more literature to support that individuals can improve improve physical function, so how well they can carry out activities of daily life. This is particularly critical for individuals who might be undergoing very harsh forms of chemotherapy, mm -hmm. who may be strictly re restricted to the inpatient setting, where they see dramatic <clears throat> reductions in physical ability and muscle mass. And so a lot of research is being dedicated to that area as well. Another area I'd like to mention that I think is great gaining more and more attention is exercise in what we call the prehab setting or the prehabilitation setting. And there have been some initial studies in this area looking at more biologic outcomes. Can exercise actually affect tumor size? But now more of these studies are actually looking at this from the standpoint of can we have individuals exercise from during the from the time they're diagnosed up until they go to surgery to try to increase their level of fitness, make them stronger, improve their cardio vascular system. So that way they're in essence stronger when they go into some of these pretty harsh treatments. And I think that's an exciting area that although it's complicated because it's a lot to ask of a patient once they become diagnosed, it is a very promising area in essence so that we're sort of training the patient to become strong as they start to undergo these areas. But to summarize, to answer your question, absolutely exercise can have some profound effects on, on treatment outcomes, particularly symptoms, and that people generally will feel better. And there's a number of studies that will support that as well. It's very interesting, really, Christina, because you know, when we think about patients and their survival, we often think about the, the tumor or the cancer that they may have. But in addition, mm -hmm. the role that comorbidities play in a patient's survival and their Absolutely. well-being post-surgery or post-treatment is so important. And that's why I think mm -hmm. this field and the work that you're involved in is, is really quite fascinating and very interesting with a really great in, uh, potential for impact. It's, it's mm -hmm. very, very impressive. Thanks. Kind of along a, a similar vein, I wanted to ask a little bit. So really for anyone who's listening today, one of the key questions in their minds will be, what are the things I can be involved in? What are the types of things that I can be doing which would essentially uh, reduce my cancer risk? Now, I know in lung cancer, obviously, this is the disease that I work in. One of the key things that you can do is to either not start smoking in the first place or obviously to, to quit smoking. And there are some of the most important things that you can do to reduce your risk of lung cancer and indeed other cancer types as well. And I know that the NCI has sponsored and led many studies that have contributed to policy that have helped to reduce the overall tobacco burden. And that has been a really strong cancer prevention um, initiative. But maybe, Verta, I'll go to you first. In addition to tobacco, can you talk a little bit about some other key things and key initiatives that we have been successful at in terms of reducing cancer sure. risk? Well, certainly one of them is in the area of breast cancer, where we've had uh, two trials actually have demonstrated that we have agents that can help to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And it brings to uh, discussion the, the question of um, making use of what has already been done, implementation science. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important for individuals to talk to their primary care physicians, um, understanding your family history. And, and we understand that there are populations for which the discussions of cancer is not an easy one, or perhaps there's not even the word of cancer. Mm -hmm. So I think one, to have discussions and know uh, as much about your family history as possible, but also ask questions to your primary care physicians so that you can take advantage of the information mm -hmm. that is available mm -hmm. to us to reduce risk of developing breast cancer. Would you like to talk a little bit maybe about HPV? 
Sure. I, I think it's uh, the uh, human papillomas virus that's mm -hmm. associated with cervical cancer uh, in, in particular for this discussion. Um, I think that uh, it, it's an interesting area in terms of disparities, because if you think about it from the prevention uh, area for uh, vaccines for mm -hmm. younger individuals, actually the uptake among African-Americans is greater than it is in Caucasian children. Mm -hmm. um, but again, there are uh, disparities there, but I think that um, research is looking at areas to administer the agent less Mm -hmm. um, two doses, three doses yeah. versus two, now two versus one. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's very important. I think there are some barriers there. Um, and interestingly, there are the barriers, I think, in some cases here are actually the parents, which brings in a very important factor. Right. And where the discussions take place uh, at, at the pediatric level or whether they're in the schools. So I think mm -hmm. that is another disease for which um, we have um, things available that can certainly impact uh, uh, the development of the advanced mm -hmm. cervical cancer or even a, a testing the, the disease. And mm -hmm. we have within our program uh, sites where we, this would, I think, be very helpful uh, to implement. I think you, you've touched on something very important, which is the whole field of implementation. Yes. And you touched on a little bit too, Christina, when you were talking and you, you mentioned, of course, the physical activity, it's been, there's fairly good evidence now to suggest that it is a very good um, health, there's a lot of health benefits essentially from uh, physical activity in terms of cancer prevention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the biggest barriers in terms of implementation of those guidelines? And in your work to date, have you seen any specific uh, differences by population or racial or ethnic group? Yes, absolutely. I think there's disparities that exist with participation in physical activity, perhaps similar to, I think, where you had mentioned it earlier about what may even exist with just accessing medical oncology care. Mm -hmm. um, transportation can be an issue. Um, fear, feeling unsafe, not knowing what to do. If, if somebody were to just tell a patient, go exercise, will they feel comfortable with just saying, okay, I'm going to go out and do this, that, or the other. Often it could just be not knowing what to do um, or knowing what resources are available within their community, um, if there are any. So that's another issue is lack of resources um, to perform exercise or physical activity. I think there has been, I can, I can really only speak to the Los Angeles area, but I think there has been an increase over the last number of years to, to provide free exercise in a variety of different forms, mm -hmm. whether community centers, some of our patients tell us about programs at their kids' schools for parents that are free. So I think a lot of it also comes down to spreading the word of what's out there. And perhaps even from our end, what we can do is investigate those resources. And this is part of what we're doing in one of our trials I can speak about later is really put together and do our homework, all of the resources that we can find that the patients may not find. And that way we can share that with them as well. But I think the bar common barriers are definitely transportation, um, not knowing what to do or is something safe, um, lack of ac accessibility to exercise resources, um, and then time. Time, I think, is always a, a big barrier, but perhaps what's unique within minority populations, we see this specifically within the Hispanic population is they're often caring for other family members um, where it could not just be grandparents, but it could be also aunts, uncles, their sisters, children, brothers, et cetera. And so family is obviously very important and uh, that is where they potentially might need to prioritize their time. So time, mm -hmm. but I think time will always be an issue for fitting and exercise, but I think particularly of concern when we're trying to tell people to go exercise and they do have all of these things that they're juggling. I think one of the things we need to think about also are the trial designs, because mm -hmm. if it's an intervention, which you're talking about lifestyle, exercise, and diet, we need to make sure that the interventions and dietary changes are going to be acceptable for what they have actually done for the, you know, they can be, they can learn about more nutritious things. But if you've had a particular diet, if you've had a, a diet of, from, from Cuba or, and then you're asked yes. to totally change your, your diet, uh, they may not be sustainable because I think importantly, yes. We need to have, if you, if we have a successful trial that demonstrates something that's efficacious, the big question is sustainability. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. will you be able to continue what has been effective for you while in the trial? So mm -hmm. I think that's something that we need to uh, take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that similarly exists with physical activity. If people are sedentary and we tell them to go and do 150 minutes of, of aerobic exercise, that can sound very daunting. Yes. 
And so putting it into perhaps also cultural needs, but then also maybe what their lifestyle can fit in, something can help. And maybe that's where, you know, the field of sort of sedentary behavior and reducing sedentary behavior can tap into that a little bit, just getting people to start moving more as opposed to truly having to hit all of those minutes of exercise, which can be quite daunting if people have never exercised in their lifetime. And like real world trial design, really. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <absolutely. laughs> yeah. um, we've touched on this kind of a little bit, but I, I think as, as, as you know, the NCI has really placed a high importance on counter health disparities and equity research. So I want to talk a little bit about how NCI is reaching disproportionately affected racial ethnic minorities and under, underserved populations, and how it's also working to address the disproportionate burden of cancer that we've been talking about for the, for the past number um, of minutes. One of the things that I think is always very important to, to talk about, and I think, again, most of us will know this, is that the factors that contribute to disparities are complex. So as you've been talking about, it's not just one thing, it's multifactorial. And I think one of the things that I've seen is, even what we've been talking about this morning, is that the breadth of research that NCI supports is also very broad. So for example, in, in our Center for Cancer Research, the work that we do looks at some of the biological and genetic bases of cancer disparities, and obviously some of the work that you're doing focus more on some of the more sociological and also environmental factors. One of the studies, as I said, that we work on, it's, um, it's again, it's sponsored by the NCI, but we're able to look at how the intersection of biology, socioeconomic status and environment contribute to lung cancer, but also to breast and to prostate cancer as well. And I think there's a great value in that sort of intersectional, mm -hmm. integrative sort of work. In addition to funding this type of interdisciplinary work within the NCI itself here in the Intramural Programme, Bert, I know that you have also been very heavily involved in the NCI Community Oncology Research Programme. And so I wondered if you'd maybe talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, the NCI Community Oncology Program, it's actually a follow-up to a legacy trial that started in the mid-80s, mm -hmm. designed to provide access to those individuals who were not going to get their care in academic centers, which is the majority of mm -hmm. uh, individuals. Um, it was noted early on that we didn't have access to minority patients participating uh, at an adequate level. So uh, there was a focus on minority uh, mm -hmm. populations as well. So within the uh, new NCORE program, uh, we have 46 community sites. 12 of them are actually targeted to minority populations. One okay. is actually pediatric. And this is important because it's an academic community partnership in which individuals do have access to clinical trials, to NCI-sponsored clinical trials. Um, it, we brought into the program in 2014 cancer care delivery research, and we're very excited about that because that means that we are not only uh, providing access to the individual, mm -hmm. but we're also looking at the providers who yeah. significantly influence outcomes, as well as the institutions and whether uh, we have many, many uh, different types of oncology practices within our program, uh, increasingly health systems. Um, and it, so we're providing access. We also are allowing the development of concepts and, and studies that are really influenced by the questions within the communities. Yeah. And then the next step is that we can look at the institutions through which these studies are conducted. Um, we've had a lot of success in doing uh, cancer prevention trials. We've had pivotal trials in prostate and breast. Um, but a significant proportion of our portfolio looks at toxicities and adverse events, as we've heard about from Christina. Yeah. Uh, we look at toxicities from our agents, whether they're cardiotox cardiotoxicities, yeah. peripheral neuropathy from some of our agents, um, screening trials. But I also, because we understand that uh, the medical oncologists who primarily run uh, our program were trained to do treatment mm -hmm. and that's bread and butter. So um, our programs are charged to do as close to 50-50 as possible cancer control prevention and screening yeah. and 50% um, treatment so mm -hmm. that uh, that's done in the community setting. So we talked a little bit about um, how NCI is trying to address this. So in, in addition to research, there's also quite a few outreach programs so one of the ones that I'm particularly familiar with is sponsored by the NCI Center for Reduction of Cancer Health Disparities, or CRCHD, and it's called the Continuing Umbrella of Research Opportunities. And Christina, I know that you're familiar with this program as well, and it's called Cure, Cure for Short. It's, it's a very interesting training program because it specifically focuses on individuals from backgrounds that are typically underrepresented in cancer research and cancer health disparities. 
And what's interesting about it is that it's been ongoing now for almost 25 years, trained over and supported over 3,000 young investigators, leaders, students, trainees. It actually starts at high school and continues all the way through to their uh, professional careers. And it's a really passionate program that really is focused on increasing diversity in the biomedical workforce. I know that this is something, Berkha, that you've talked a little bit about as well um, and how important that is. I'm very excited because this year they have extended the CURE program to bring fellows into the NCI as well. Mm -hmm. So historically, the fellows have gone to various universities throughout the United States, but this year they've expanded it and there's actually two fellows in, in my lab. And it's a really wonderful program. Um, and I, the, for the two fellows in my lab, I'm very confident that they have you know, great careers ahead of them. But even already, I'm seeing the value of that sort of outreach program and the impact that it's having in their careers. And in, in, in my career, I've met people along the way who through programs like this, um, they talk about how, how important it is to sustainability in their careers. And I know this is something that you think about as well, a lot, Borta, this idea of, you know, educating and supporting people early, but continuing that support throughout their career. Absolutely. We talk about the workforce uh, quite frequently, um, and we also speak of in terms of having diversity within, mm -hmm. the, within the workforce, and uh, we are careful in trying to uh, implement that, certainly within our program with the community investigators. Um, but we also uh, have investigators who are in basic science mm -hmm. or who want to have access to the real world, yeah. um, and so they interact with our investigators. But I, I think that we all feel that uh, the workforce is important. We have, I think, probably the mm -hmm. premier cancer prevention fellowship program, and we're absolutely delighted that cancer disparities has become of great interest within that program. So we're hoping that uh, in addition to the CURE program, which starts yeah. maybe a little bit uh, younger, that we uh, can sustain and, and uh, continue to encourage people to have interest in uh, disparities in cancer care. I am a former CPFP fellow. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, yeah, so there's a connection we didn't know, Berta. Um, so I guess to move on maybe a little bit, we're all cancer researchers, essentially. So maybe want to spend a little bit of time talking about the types of research that, 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 that we do. As I mentioned at the beginning, my lab focuses primarily on lung cancer. My background is primarily in, in basic science, but through the Cancer Prevention Fellowship Program, it was a really formative training experience for me because the first year was a Master's of Public Health. And again, it's a tremendous program. But then by coming to the NCI, I was able to get access to the, the breadth of research that we're doing here and really became immersed, <clears throat> excuse me, at that time in cancer health disparities research. In our group, we, at the moment, we have sort of two key questions. The first of these is trying to understand and really try and unravel why the incidence of lung cancer is so much higher in African Americans than almost any other racial or ethnic group in the United States. And we talked a little bit earlier about tobacco. So if the incidence is higher, I'm sure you're thinking, well, maybe the tobacco exposure is higher. But it's a bit of a paradox because actually it's not. And almost every measure of smoking that we have is lower amongst African Americans compared with European Americans. So we really don't understand why the disease is higher in this population. And so we're using the study that I mentioned a moment ago. It's an NCI study that started in 1998. And so we've been following this population since then. And we recruit about 40% of our population as African Americans. So we are well, well set up and powered to ask these types of questions, but we're looking beyond smoking. So we're looking at environmental factors, lifestyle factors, but also biological factors as well, and see if there's any other genetic factors that can explain what we see. The second key question that we have at the moment is really trying to address the limited inclusion of minority populations in the types of precision medicine studies that we're now doing. I think this is really important because most of the discoveries that we're making now in terms of cancer treatment and advances, it's really based on an in-depth understanding of the biology of a tumor. And it, that's very exciting and I think that's wonderful. But in order to be sure that we can make sure these advances are applicable to all populations, most of the work that's been done has been done on populations like Caucasian populations or populations mm -hmm. of European descent. So we really need to address that lack of inclusion of minority populations. And in our studies, that's what we try to do. So then the study that we have the patients who are generous enough to donate their tissues to us, we analyze those tumors and we look at the biology to see what's similar and what's different. And what's interesting is that even in lung cancer, we do find specific parts of biology that are different in African Americans. And now what we're trying to do is to see if we can leverage that to develop more, more treatment or new treatments, essentially. So they're the two kind of key 
research questions that we have in, in our lab at the moment. <clears throat> and Bert, I know, again, continuing that theme of precision medicine, one of the very exciting studies <clears throat> excuse me, that you've been involved in is, of course, the MATCH trial. Yes, um, the MATCH trial is <clears throat> the molecular uh, analysis for, th uh, for therapy choice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as I mentioned, our network participates in treatment trial, and this was very important. But this was a trial that was designed to determine if target agents, in, uh, those individuals who had gene mutations, um, were effective mm -hmm. regardless of the cancer type. Um, so this was a trial in which the uh, tumor specimens were collected from advanced diseases. They were used advanced technology of DNA sequencing, um, and then they were matched if they were targetable agents. And I think this was, I think, our first uh, major precision trial, certainly uh, recently. Um, and importantly, um, the community enrollment was 44% in the match trial, um, and the minority participation was 20%, and that was significantly contributed by the community sites. Mm -hmm. um, so this is very exciting, but it brings to question the fact that our clinical trials are changing. Uh, yeah. The trials are not like they were a decade ago. So I think there are many factors that we need to think about in terms of making sure that we don't have disparities, making sure mm -hmm. that they are conducted in the real world setting so that these mm -hmm. exciting advances can be applicable. Um, and also to make sure that our investigators, uh, that investigative team mm -hmm. uh, knows how to present these trials so that patients yeah. are adequately informed. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's clear from both of your research experience that you're both quite heavily involved actually in clinical trial research and you've just talked a little bit there about about the match trial but there's a there's a wealth of research that's taking place in your program Berta. so would you like to talk maybe a little bit more about some of the other clinical trials that you've been doing well one of the things that uh came into our program uh just a little before uh, the NCORE program was screening so we're conducting a uh, screening trial now the tomosynthesis um, uh, imaging uh, trial mm -hmm. that's comparing uh, 2D versus 3D or tomosynthesis versus mm -hmm. digital. And the question here is whether tomosynthesis reduces advanced cancers compared to mm -hmm. 2D. So this is a screening mm -hmm. trial. So the endpoint is, is the reduction in breast cancer mm -hmm. mortality. Uh, it's a large trial, yeah. 165,000 wow. women. And we're proud to say that we have uh, support for those women who are uninsured. Um, so I think there are uh, many uh, important questions that are uh, in this trial. Um, one of the things that we're very proud of is the fact that we're collecting specimens um, from the biopsies, whether they're benign, pre-malignant, or invasive. And mm -hmm. this will be the first time that we'll have such a biorepository that will be available <clears throat> for researchers at the completion of the trial. So uh, we're very excited about that. Yeah, really valuable, really valuable resource. Christina, I wanted to come back to you a little bit because I know that most of your research, if not maybe all of your research, quite <laughs> excitingly, is clinical trial based. And that's quite mm -hmm. unique for a researcher to be to be able to do that in, in, in your field. So you have many studies ongoing, but I wondered if you could maybe pick two or three and just tell us about them. I know you've had some interesting work published very recently that seems very impactful. So mm -hmm. could you talk maybe talk us through a little bit of those key research studies? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll start off with one of our uh, recently completed trials where it was actually funded by, by NCI from a K07 award that I had, and it funded an exercise trial for breast cancer survivors, but we were particularly looking at metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, if an individual has metabolic syndrome, they're at an increased risk for heart disease and diabetes. So a lot of what my lab does is tries to use, tries to implement exercise in order to reduce the these comorbid conditions that onset during survivorship. But you Uniquely, we were able to capture a relatively diverse sample. So we had about 50% from the Hispanic population and then the other 50% non-Hispanic. Um, and so we were able to compare and to really delve out whether the Hispanic ethnicity impacted potentially the results of exercise. What we found, I think, was not surprising. Um, we actually found that the Hispanic population were, had poor metabolic health. Um, they had higher body fat. Um, they had higher levels of fasting glucose, higher levels of, if you will, metabolic syndrome, um, less physically active. Um, they also had uh, more, although this is unsubstantiated with epidemiologic literature, they did have higher stage of breast cancer um, and they had um, undergone more, uh, excuse me, severe treatments as a result of that. So then when we 
intervened with the exercise, we then found that they had a greater benefit from exercise, perhaps because they started at maybe a worse level. So they had a higher ceiling in order to get to from that benefit of exercise. So that's some recent work. Um, we do have a, a new study that we have recently begun um, where we're actually specifically now targeting the Hispanic breast cancer population, where they will come to us and actually do a clinical exercise intervention supervised with a trainer, which is in our typical wheelhouse here within my lab. But now what we're going to do is actually after they finish that clinical intervention is we're going to allow them to choose a YMCA of their choice. And we are going to provide them with a membership and with exercises to do, but they're on their own to do them. So we're in essence providing them with all of the resources they need at first by having them come to our exercise clinic, but then we're then placing them out into more of a real world setting, but still in a structured exercise facility, um, particularly so that they can have resources to perform the exercise. We're also providing them with a family membership. So this is really important for a variety of minority groups is to have family support and to have even somebody to exercise with. So we're, we wanted to make sure we could provide that as well, as well as transportation. And then actually the third phase of that study is we are removing all of the resources we're giving them and simply observing what they then adopt in now the real world setting where we're not paying for a gym membership. The goal of this study, surprisingly, is actually not behavioral change adoption. It's actually still insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, because we still want to focus in on those comorbid conditions that in particular the Hispanic population is at risk of. Um, so that's one example of a newer study we're doing also looking in the treatment setting or during yeah. during the chemotherapy setting, we recently um, received funding to launch a new study where we're actually going to deliver the exercise intervention during chemotherapy, particularly in Hispanic adults with metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, because particular here at USC, we have some epidemiologic data to show that the Hispanic population is at a higher risk of mortality, even given the same treatment from metastatic colorectal cancer patients uh, for colorectal cancer when compared to their non-Hispanic counterparts. So we're gonna try to test whether exercise can actually improve chemotherapy efficacy and reduce the chemotherapy toxicity. So in other words, try to make the patient stronger during treatment so they can tolerate the treatment and then perhaps they will they will live longer. Um, and then just more broadly, I'll briefly mention that we are actively, given that our region of where we're located here in Los Angeles is, is very diverse, but it's also, as you can imagine, based off of what I've just described, it's, it, it, particularly as diverse within the Hispanic community. But beyond this East LA region, as we know more central and south parts of LA, we have access to other diverse populations such as African-Americans. So one of our priorities is also outreach to those communities so that we can also build a more diverse research program that can include both Hispanics and then also the African-American communities as well as the Asian communities as well. So we're trying to make a full effort there to access those communities. Communities. I think, Warda, what you mentioned is really critical in that with clinical trials, there, there needs to be more of them so that we can offer them to these patients of these minority populations. So that's one thing we're trying to we're trying to do is increase the number of studies we have for these populations. We have very high adherence with these minority groups. It's over 80% for clinical exercise. Um, so we know if, if to be cliche, if we build it, then they will come, but they need to know about it and we need to have it. Um, and then we found that the patients generally come and they like to come and they see the benefits of exercise. So that's been yeah. great. And I think what's clear in what you've described there is so it's, it's so, so clear that that real world design that we talked a little bit a while ago, it's really integrated into your study. So yeah. I, I think the potential for impact there is, is even greater. Mm -hmm. uh, we just to move on a little bit, but sort of in, in the same vein, we know that many of the same population groups that experience cancer health disparities are also significantly underrepresented in clinical trials. Now, I know you've talked a little bit about your efforts to, to address that, but I want to talk a little bit about this just a little bit more before we open up the topic to the audience, because I do think it is extremely important. And so I wanted to ask you both a little bit about your efforts and the efforts that you're aware of to really try and bridge this diversity gap in clinical trials. 
And Bertha, I'll start with you. Well, I think one of the things that we have learned over time is that our eligibility criterion are rather stringent. Mm. Uh, you know, the talk is, you know, it's only the healthy cancer patients that get into the clinical trials. Yeah. So there has been quite a bit of work in addressing that, uh, working with NCI and other professional societies, for example, in mm. allowing patients who are HIV positive. Mm -hmm. um, we know that in clinical trials, we have classically collect age, race, and ethnicity, and the insurance status. Mm -hmm. Um, we have implemented a tool um, through which we collect extensive information about the participants in our trials. Um, we are looking at education, income, mm -hmm. uh, method of, uh, of, di of the insurance at the time of diagnosis, which is important because if you haven't, have not been insured prior to the diagnosis, that's a different type of information coming yeah. to us. But we're also collecting rather crudely um, other chronic diseases. And that, I think, is the second uh, issue with uh, participating in clinical trials is that with the increase in uh, obesity and the fact that um, as you get older, you have more diseases. So the question becomes um, to really know about who's participating in our trial, how cancer doesn't select out the healthiest. So those patients come in and need to be treated with state-of-the-art care and, and have generalizability from our trials. So we are collecting to who are our participants and how can we help to uh, maintain those patients, some of whom have to come off therapy because of their chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. So uh, engaging primary care physicians, I think is important. Um, and the cost of participating in clinical trials and their coverage. NCI has initiated um, uh, a coverage analysis for its clinical trials so that on the ground, when the investigators are placing their um, patients on clinical trials, they have an understanding of what's covered. Uh, financial toxicity certainly is something that we talk about in clinical trials. <clears throat> and of course, I know that you're one of the key um, programs that you use is, of course, the NCORE programs, mm -hmm. which really helps you to, to address really what we're talking about, which is reducing the diversity gap in terms of clinical trials, enrollment, and keeping people within trials as well and supporting them while they're through it. Um, Christina, you touched on it a little bit when you when you were talking about it, but I just wondered if there's anything else you wanted to add about where obviously there can be barriers to, to, to increasing the enrollment of minority mm -hmm. within clinical trials, but where have you seen those hurdles? Where have you seen ways to get around those barriers? And clearly you're being successful in your trials in, in doing that. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I think that that one of the main entry points is in the recruitment process. Mm -hmm. um, of course, outreach is very important in working with local organizations in the community and local health clinics, et cetera. And, and that sort of infrastructure, at least within Los Angeles, is exists. Um, but in particular, with my experience, when we recruit in our hospitals, um, so we primarily will recruit from our Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, but also from our Los Angeles County mm -hmm. Hospital, which is two very very different centers, speaking of insurance, one more from the uninsured, um, underserved individuals, that would be the LA County Hospital. So when we recruit, we definitely, we do it face to face, we do it hands on, of course, we don't rely on the medical providers, because they're there to, to treat the patient. Um, and we make sure and, and this is not profound, but we make sure that we are spending adequate time with the patient and their family to explain to them every detail of the study, what's required required of them, what time commitment it's going to take. Anything from any visual aids have been really, really helpful. Just simple maps of the area, especially in big cities, I'm sure like the Washington DC area as well as Los Angeles, just getting around and making it accessible to them so that they understand where specifically they're going because our exercise clinic is not in the hospital. Um, also, we've also come up with um, infographics mm -hmm. that under that sort of lay out very simply each of our clinical trials and what's going to happen at what time point that's not too wordy, that's not too too dense, where they can really map their way through and figure out what's going to be asked of them at every time point. So again, it's not necessarily profound, but I think it's something that's really important given that we just need, we allow extra time in order to make sure that they also understand and their family members understand. We've had a number of participants who will bring their family members with them to all of their visits. And it's so important that their family members also understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and what the benefit it might be. 
So that's just one example of where we've taken particular caution in particular. Yeah. Of course, also language is important. So often we're recruiting individuals who speak another language, having all of the materials in that language, but then also having staff who are native speakers of that language has been really critical as well. I think that's great. I, I just want to maybe take a few moments now to turn over to some live questions from the viewers, if, if that's great. okay with you both. Sure. Um, yes. I think we have some some coming through. So um the first question through is triple negative breast cancer incidence and mortality is higher in african-american women and yet participation of african-american women is extremely low so how do we make progress so i'm going to assume participation must be participation in clinical trials um that's i assume that's what they're getting to in the question so we've touched on it a little bit but maybe Bertha, you want to pick that up yeah i i would i i think that looking at the data from the nci clinical trials mm -hmm. network actually the representation of african-american women in our breast cancer uh, trials actually does pretty much match what it is in society i i think that mm -hmm. what is happening is our trials are getting smaller so we don't have our very mm -hmm. large adjuvant trials anymore so our trials are targeted toward for example triple negative and they they run in alignment with what agents are available to be tested. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also say that, as I mentioned, that we have um, uh, already uh, agents for the reduction of mm -hmm. ER positive disease. We don't have agents uh, mm -hmm. with known efficacy for triple negative, and that's a very high yeah. research priority area. Yeah, no question. Uh, mm -hmm. Christina, anything you want to, to add? Uh, I the one comment I can make on this is that um, as and of course, as it pertains to exercise and lifestyle interventions, is that this is definitely a high area of need for interventions as interventions are concerned. Um, I think there's a handful of studies with exercise interventions in this group. Um, and so hopefully that's an area that we can bolster as as scientists moving forward. I mean, and just also to, to finish on that, the reviewer specifically mentioned triple negative breast cancer, but I think the comment can be expanded to almost any cancer type. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the moment, one of the biggest, we didn't talk about it today, but one of the biggest breakthroughs that there has been in terms of cancer treatment, obviously, is you know, immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. And NCI, of course, has played a, a key role in that. And I think really in those clinical trials as well, making sure that we have sufficiently enrolled or sufficient numbers of minority populations so that we can assess efficacy of those particular drugs across populations is so important Absolutely. because, you know, like many of these new agents, they work by specifically targeting a key aspect of tumor biology. Mm -hmm. And if there are differences in tumor biology across populations, we need to know that. And so I, I think that's also really important. I think the, the, the viewer's comment is very on point, but could be extended really yes. to almost any any clinical trial. We, we have a second question here. Um, so the question is, is there any research being done into why Hispanic males have a high rate of lymphoma compared with, with other groups. Hmm. So I'd have to say off the top, um, I'm not aware of any specific research but myself, because obviously my, my field is in lung cancer, but I think that one of the key resources that's out there at the moment to help us identify these trends is, of course, the SEER database. And I think most of us would be familiar with that. Yes. And that's, of course, a national effort that's been ongoing for 30 more years, I think, at this stage. <laughs> yes. But what's really neat about and important about that resource is that it helps us to track and to identify these trends. So in a sense, we wouldn't know that it's important to study lymphoma and this disparity amongst males. We weren't able to identify it in, in the first place. Um, the, it's interesting that the disparity is, again, specifically amongst men, which is similar, similar to lung cancer. Um, I'm not aware of anyone specifically at NCI studying it, but yeah. I do know that for a lot of these emerging trends and disparities as they emerge, that the NCI and CRCHD are paying attention to that and identifying key areas that you know need a greater focus of, of research. So I mm -hmm. suppose that's to say, if there aren't anybody working right now, I'm, I'm sure there will be will be soon. Um, we. Oh, were you going to say something, Christina? Yes, yes. I can add to that very briefly, although sure. it's not a fantastic answer in the sense that we, I know we do have some epidemiologists here who are, we have a multi-ethnic cohort or the MET yes. cohort here um, who are trying to pin down some more of these associations with Hispanics and various cancer types. So I don't know anything beyond that's being done to deal with that disparities again, but at least from an observational standpoint, I think there are some, there is an ongoing focus on on that. Um, of course, the number of cases will 
that need to grow to help study that efficiently, I think is, is ongoing. Absolutely. So. Okay. Christina, we have a question in that I think is very specifically in your wheelhouse. And it's really such, okay. <clears throat> it's a very, we've touched on it a little bit, but it's actually it's a very good question because it's one of these real world questions. <laughs> and the viewer says, when you have cancer, you have no energy or to exercise or to be physically mm -hmm. active. So the question that the viewer is asking is what do you do? Yes, that is a question that we get a lot. And I think that when we speak to individuals um, who are considering to start exercising, um, they that is probably one of their biggest apprehensions, if, especially if they're undergoing treatment, particularly. Um, so my biggest recommendation would be to start small. Um, mm -hmm. Something as simple as just, it, it, depending on, on where the person is at and how, um, maybe how tired they are or where physically they are at within their course of treatment, but to start with something very manageable. Again, the, the exercise guidelines can be very daunting at 150 yeah. minutes per week. So perhaps even something, it could be something as simple as standing up and down out of a chair five times. Could be something as simple as walking out to a mailbox or perhaps even walking around the block if that's mm -hmm. not too far. So something in very small amounts if not maybe once a day, maybe a couple times of a day, just to allow your body to move, allow the muscles to contract, allow the heart to pump. It can be extremely hard because if there's no energy, then it can be challenging. But generally speaking, we found that patients who are able to do it, even in small amounts, yeah. can feel like they have more energy um, and will perhaps even increase their appetite because they might be more hungry because they've burned some calories from doing a little bit. So it, I, I, very common question, completely yeah. understand how challenging this can be. So my recommendation would just be to start with something very small, small and safe. Um, and if anything, of course, speak to the medical oncologist um, to see if there's any specific guidelines they can recommend, just given that they would know the treatment history of that person at that time. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Okay, so we have, um, yeah, we have one more in. The question is, what are some of the resources that NCI offers to oncologists and other cancer care providers regarding exercise, physical activity during cancer treatment? So again, Christine, I think this one might be in your wheelhouse. Mm, yeah, sure. So I guess I, as far as uh, exercise during treatment, um, I guess if this is in the context of studies to participate in, that's probably something different that we, and, and definitely feel free for both of you to weigh in. Perhaps a resource could be something like clinicaltrials.gov, yes. um, where you can actually search for different studies that might be going on. Um, of course, definitely contacting a care provider to see. Um, I think one of the easiest resources, if an individual has access to technology and Wi-Fi, is simply look up, do a Google search and look up what might be in your area. The YMCA has great programs, but they're not, they may not necessarily be free. Community centers can have programs um, just depending on, on where an individual might live. Um, I don't know of a sort of nationwide resource for exercise because I think that that, that was going to vary so much by region. Um, there are also a number of cancer support organizations that offer free classes and that offer um, a list of resources that an individual might be able to reach out to. So I guess my biggest recommendation would be to, of course, start with the healthcare team, medical oncologists, and perhaps even others, they come and get primary care physician to see what resources are out there. Um, I always I always say this and I'm happy to say it here and that I'm happy to be an avenue for a resource. Um, if there's any way that I can help people find exercise, that's never a bad thing that I would stir away from. I'd more than be happy to um, have email conversations with individuals who need to find resources in their area. I'd be happy to do that as well. Brilliant. I'm sure people will take you off on that, Christina. Um, I think we have time for just one last question. Um, and this is actually, again, a very good question, I think, to, to end on. The viewer wants to know if there is any concrete evidence to suggest that the MATCH trial, which is matching targeted therapies to genetic anomalies in patients outside approved indications, really improves outcome. So is there any evidence, Berta, that I this trial is going to do what it says on the tin? There were so many small studies and it's a, roll, a rolling event. And mm -hmm. remember, this was the signal study to determine if there was any efficacy, any responses. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and three of the trials have been presented at national meetings. Uh, they're the small ones, um, but there were way over 20 agents. And so they continue to be promising. And remember, the signal is to take us to the next stage for a larger trial that would provide more evidence for a participation. Yeah. So. That's and I guess too, to you know, to make the point that this yeah. trial as well, when it started, there was very good evidence that led to it. So I yes, think the optimism absolutely. that it is actually going to make a difference is probably quite yes, high. But we yes. await the results mm -hmm. of those studies absolutely uh, with great anticipation. I think, unfortunately, that's all we, we have time for today in terms of questions. I want to sincerely thank all of you for tuning in today and also to thank both Christine and Verta for spending time with us here today. I think my take home message primarily from our conversation is essentially a lot done and a lot more. A lot more to do. Mm -hmm. uh, do either of you want to add anything briefly before we go, before we sign off? No, no, you're good. No, just thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, as a reminder, I'd like to um, to finish and remind all of you to join the Office of Minority Health's month uh, month campaign this this April, which is active and healthy. And you can learn more about that by clicking on the link provided in the comments section. And so finally, before we go, I'd also like to remind you all that the video will remain on the NCI's Facebook page and also NCI's YouTube channel. And any questions in the comments that we didn't get to today, hopefully will be answered shortly. And you can always contact NCI's Cust uh, Cancer Information Service at 1-800-4-CANCER or also by visiting cancer.gov forward slash cancer for our live health chat um, service. Again, thank you all very much for tuning in today to our latest social media event. Thank you very much and good afternoon. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER, produced April 2019. Yay!